So it's a, it's a real pleasure and a great honor uh, to have this opportunity to introduce Vladimir Hachinsky. So Dr. Hachinsky is a professor of neurology and a distinguished university professor at Western University. Um, he founded with uh, John uh, Norris the first successful acute stroke unit, which has become the standard of care. Um, and with David uh, Sacchetto, discovered the key role of the insula in mediating sudden death. Um, he introduced the concepts of terms such, like, such as multi-infarct dementia uh, and also vascular cognitive impairment and devised also the Hachinsky ischemic score. Um, I could tell you a lot of things um, about all the achievements because the list is really, really long. Um, I could, for example, tell you that Dr. Hachinsky has contributed over 800 uh, scientific papers, uh, book chapters, editorials, and also um, other scholarly publications with over 27,000 citations and an index, H index of 79. Um, he is also the author and co-author and editor um, of 17 books, including the one called Stroke, a comprehensive guide to brain attack. So he's an authority and uh, has contributed to foundational knowledge um, uh, in terms of dementia and in stroke. Um, so these are things that you can also find elsewhere, but I'd like to... Um, you, don't, you also know all the information about the, um, the prices. The 2017 Hachinsky was um, inducted into the Canadian Medical Hall of Fame. In 2018, he was also a recipient, as you all know, of the Killam Prize. This is why we have the honor of having him with us today. Before I move on, we did say that my introduction is going to be brief because we will have some minutes afterwards for some interaction and, and some discussions afterwards. So we want to keep some time for that. But I still want to take just a very few seconds to, um, to also acknowledge that um, uh, Vladimir uh, strikes me as a fascinating scholar who um, has a very inquisitive mind, uh, a deep humanity and an honest interest for, and for the, uh, seeking knowledge and also the foundations of knowledge and how we acquire knowledge. And I think you've heard that from some of the discussions uh, we've had before. Uh, so I'm looking really forward to his talk and to the opportunity to debate with him afterwards. Please uh, join me in welcoming Vladimir Hachinsky. The obvious question that arises is that why would I, with the help of my students, my patients, and my colleagues, achieve respectability in one field, risk looking like a fool by talking about things I know little about? I think one answer is that knowledge, oh, knowledge accrues in pieces, but is understood in patterns. And few people dare look at patterns and make suggestions. But if we, the Kilimanjaro's, don't do it, who will? If this is not the time, when? I suggest that we have the opportunity of beginning to paint patterns that could then be tested, accepted, or rejected. So please look at my presentation, not as a presentation for an expert, but as an explorer, as will be my fellow Kilimanjaro's. So at the end, I hope to generate a number of questions that may or may not have been answered, and I'll come to some tentative conclusions. So first, let me give you the outline of what I hope to cover. The background to my interest in the relationship between the arts and the sciences goes back to the year 2000, when I was given an honorary degree at the University of Salamanca, founded in 1218. And I chose to talk about neurognosis, a term that I suggested, that comes from narrow brain agnosis knowledge. In other words, by understanding the brain, <clears throat> we might begin to understand some relationships between science and the arts. Now, <clears throat> the person who nominated me for the award was a former rector. His name is Julio Fermoso. And he managed to get the leading composer of Spain called uh, uh, um, Hafner, and then the vice director of the Re Royal Academy of the Language of, uh, of Spain to participate, and then Portera Sanchez, who was a neurologist, who was also an art critic. And he became rich by identifying promising artists, buying their works, and then when they became Famous, of course, he had valuable collections. So valuable, he couldn't afford the insurance. So he kept the pictures in a, in a country home. Uh, we had two colloquia, one in Salamanca and one in Madrid. And then I returned to Canada to my day job, and I really didn't think much about it till last year. 
and you've heard that story. So let me proceed. We're talking about uh, three related concepts, rhythm, synchrony, and harmony. Um, I am grateful to Andre for showing a picture of uh, a, a bridge and then a collapsed bridge because in terms of synchrony, it is said that if a bunch of soldiers cross a bridge at random, nothing happens. If they go in synchrony, it may well break down. There's power, there's energy saving in that. And harmony is a related concept because you have synchrony in different voices. Think of a fugue. So I think you can generalize and say, we want to have synchrony in physics, we want to have synchrony in the brain, we want to have synchrony in society, in our relationships. And the related terms and concepts are harmony. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the brain and the normal rhythms in the brain. Most people do not appreciate that half of brains are white matter. If you relate the gray matter we have to some of the apes, the percentage is not that different. What is hugely different is white matter. And by the way, the relationship between intelligence, however it's measured, uh, is better with white matter and than with gray matter. And I hate to admit it, but women have more gray, white matter. It has been known for a long time that they have, for example, the corpus callosum, uh, you know, the, the, the big bundle that connects two hemispheres. We have known this thicker for a long time. Now, some people extrapolate to make social explanations that they can multitask. I won't go there. I'm sharing with you the physical fact that white matter is very important, we haven't paid enough attention to it, and that in fact, uh, that, um, and as it happens, I'm reporting that as a fact, not interpretation, that relatively speaking, uh, the w women have, at least at the corpus callosum level, more white matter than men. Now, the other important concept about the brain is that it uses synchrony. You see, most of the white matter in the hemispheres is covered by, by myelin. And the myelin, uh, every so often, there is a little node. And the electrical activity, instead of going down the, the whole nerve, which takes a long time and takes a lot of energy, it's saltatory. It takes jumps. It goes from one node to the other. So it's very economical. In other words, in terms of, you know, ions going in and out of the cell, of the, of the axon, which is the, it's very economical. And the whole brain works on synchrony. In other words, you know, different rhythms, different, uh, different frequencies of rhythms. And then this is, um, this is an awake uh, 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 record, and typically you have the, the high frequencies are beta, have to do with alertness, alpha waves have to do sort of a relaxed state, then of course the theta waves that are a bit slower, and then delta waves that can be pathological, and then they also very high frequency are called ripples, and they can occur in normally or in disease. Now, sleep is much more interesting. It, uh, so this is a sort of a diagram that you begin by getting into a, a light sleep and you get a deep sleep, and then after about 90 minutes you get into REM sleep, rapid eye movement, and that's the one most associated with dreaming. And then throughout the night, REM sleep recurs. Just before you wake up, there's a surge of adrenaline, and suddenly you wake up. Now, I'm going to just show you a couple of samples of sleep. Uh, this is called the stage two, and uh, you see little wiggles, that's called spindles. And early in my career, we showed that if somebody has a stroke and they preserve their spindles, they have a better prognosis than if they are, if they are not present in the rhythmic way that I'm showing you. And then uh, there's also REM sleep, and again, I've underlined there to the right-hand side, the, the left diagram, right-hand side, there are some underlining, the, the, the sawtooth waves. Again, the type of rhythm that happens in rapid eye movement. Now, sleeping is very important. For one thing, it consolidates memory. And there's a number of papers that have been published, but the most recent one, I'm giving you here, so if you wanted to pursue this, then you have one recent one, you can go all the way back. But the point is that that's a very important stage, 
Uh, REM sleep seems, seems to be important. It's probably not the only stage in which memories and the brain consolidates information, but it's a very important one. And secondly, that during sleep, we clear out all the metabolic garbage we produce in the daytime. And again, a very recent article shows you that at night, there are waves, uh, rhythmic waves, neuronal waves, that then have blood flow waves that then clear out the garbage. If you don't sleep enough, some of that garbage doesn't clear it. And it probably contributes to your risk of developing cognitive impairment in your later years. Now, let me, again, here's where I'm sort of going beyond my comfort level and making some arguments that may or may not be valid. There is something biological and important about the rhythm 80, plus or minus 40. I say that because, you know, it roughly it's the heartbeat, if you consider, you know, the heartbeat of younger people who have higher, depending children, older have slower rhythm, but on average it's roughly 80. It turns out that most people clap at 100 beats per minute. Most people walk at that rate. We all have our personal gait, personal pr uh, preference for rhythm, etc. Uh, and also suckling, it's very similar. So in other words, there's some sort of biological, uh, not imperative, but, but, but predisposition for this rhythm. And then many pieces that are highly, you know, popular pieces are in fact in the same range, 60 to 120. Now, it's an interesting fact that humans can detect over 100 pitches in an octave. But all cultures have music. Music is the most universal of languages and the least understood. But interestingly enough, most cultures divide up the, the, the octave into twos and threes. Now, it's not to deny that you can have many, many, many very complicated scales. For example, the Indian reggae are very, very complicated. So I'm not denying that. I'm talking about what is usual in the culture. And then, again, uh, you know, it, 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 there must be, talk about coincidence or serendipity. Uh, of course, I wanted to look at the latest literature. And as it happens, there are three, I think, milestone papers on the very subject I'm telling you about. Because for a long time, there's been debate as to whether, whether, whether music is universal. And there is a paper in science now that looked at it from every angle. It all has to do with songs, but it has to do with looking at ethnographically, phonographically, from every angle. And it looks quite clear now that lullabies, dance songs, love songs, and healing songs are very similar across cultures. Typically, a lullaby is soft and slow. Dances are vigorous and rhythmic. Healing uh, have their own characteristic. So there is, there is, you know, at least the predisposition to having similar things expressed in different cultures across music. Now, but so I've said that that by the brain or biology sort of um, molds culture or, or sets the parameters for culture. But let me argue that the other thing happens as well, the other way around. Every newborn in the world could learn any language. However, by, by, so a newborn can distinguish hearing French from hearing Dutch from hearing German. By six months, they only can di differentiate between French and Dutch or German, but not between Dutch and German. And that window keeps on closing. So one of the questions is, uh, is can we keep the window open? What if we taught newborns the basic sounds of the major languages and kept reinforcing it? So when the time comes for them to learn language, they will not speak with an accent. You probably know that the older we are, the more difficult it is to learn a language like a native. And probably the watershed is puberty. I have a German friend who came to Canada when he was 11. And his older brother was 14. My friend speaks like a native Canadian. 
His older brother speaks like Henry Kissinger with a very heavy German accent. So the question is, yeah, it's a question mark. How long can we keep the window open? You probably know that Asian cultures that they rely on tones have a much finer distinction for the sounds that are important in their language. For someone like ourselves to learn Chinese is difficult, and vice versa, of course. People who speak Chinese are difficult to differentiate between L and R, for example. So it's a question that I'm posing, whether we could keep the window open. And I suspect the same is true for music. There's a recent article, again, you know, there is, there is a God, you know, <laughs> it just, this is, this is a recent paper. I mean, relatively speaking, you know, 2015 is not that long ago, uh, where they, they, they studied uh, American subjects and then people from a, an Amazonian tribe, and they found that the, the people from the United States prefer the consonant sounds, like a perfect fifth, but the people from the Amazon didn't care. And so I think one interpretation is that they were not exposed to the rhythmic things, and so they didn't develop that distinction. So the brain is malleable, and the same question arises. Uh, most uh, music preferences is set by puberty, or thereabouts. So could you again keep the window open? I mean, I like music very much, but I, I don't appreciate jazz music, for example, to the extent that I should appreciate it. And I, I try, but it doesn't quite work. So again, is there a window we can keep open? So a conclusion is the brain shapes culture and culture shapes the brain to different degrees at different types of development. Now, there was a paper, not a paper, a book published by a Canadian historian who spent most of his career at the University of Chicago. And he claimed that the reason that soldiers marched was not because that was important in battle, that it was a bonding exercise. People who marched together, stayed together, it developed a certain you know, idea of coherence. He also argued that, of course, you know, dancing together was one way of bonding, and we certainly know that. And uh, the other one is that he even felt that calisthenics done by many of the Japanese factories, the first thing they do in the morning, they do calisthenics together, that again was a fellow of bonding. And he called this muscular bonding. And there is a literature that shows that people who sing in a choir tend to synchronize their heart, heart rate. And again, uh, uh, there's even a literature to suggest that residing poetry can synchronize not only your heartbeat, but your breathing. And this specific example is from classic, uh, uh, classic uh, epics, uh, dactylic hexameter, you know, da, 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 da. Uh, so that seems to synchronize, that seems to be an important uh, observation. Now, this again is to remind you about the sequence in, in sleep. And I'll give you, I'm going to give you a small example of how uh, biology can influence art. So I had the opportunity of composing a, a wall some time ago uh, that was orchestrated by a professional electronic music composer. And so the idea is this is a girl who's working in the fields uh, uh, south of Vienna. She gets tired. She falls asleep. And all of a sudden, she is in the middle of one of the palaces, the bell of the ball, and you know, and uh, she keeps dancing, 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 dancing. Uh, then this, all of a sudden, there is this surge of music. It stops. She awakes. It was a dream. And the the, the architecture of the of the walls is is REM sleep. Like the recurrent theme is REM sleep. So I'm just going to give you a sample. So at the beginning you have the recurrent theme and at the end they give you the search. So I'll, I'll let you listen.
and the last little clip is going to be near the end when there's the surge of music then stop suddenly. a brief example of how you know that one can get inspiration from nature that people have tried to make music out of the DNA but that doesn't work very well because it's fairly repetitive but but on the other hand I think we should be looking at things that can be interactive in other words let us see how biology sets the limits of culture but also let's realize that culture is very important and plasticity is very important in other words this morning is going to change our synapses by tens of thousands. Your brain today will be different than it was yesterday. Literally true. So we, we have to remember that the brain is infinitely malleable. The more you use it, the more useful it becomes. Now, let me move on to abnormal rhythms. That could be a talk in itself, and I will not use the time to talk about that. But I'll give you two examples of my own experience. One of them is a 72-year-old lady who was admitted with a, with a warning of a stroke. We admitted her to the stroke unit. We're able to study her sleep patterns, and that's to the left. You've seen this picture before, where she has these nice sawtooth waves. Unfortunately, she went on to have a major stroke, and we're able to follow her over, over a year. And it turns out that that nicely organized rhythm became very, very, a course, as if that synchrony, that rhythmicity of the normal brain had been lost. And it's hard to think of a brain disease that does not affect synchrony. So in some ways, all brain disorders are dysrhythmic disorders. Now, the cause be quite, quite different because neurons degenerate or because you have a stroke, etc. But one way of looking at it is that in fact, they are disorganizations of rhythms. The other example has to do with the brain and the heart. And uh, this is to show you a major study that was done, directed by my colleague uh, uh, Barnett, that had to do with looking at carotid endarterectomy. In other words, whether clearing and narrowing in the carotid artery prevented a stroke. But I'm showing it because we're able to observe in great detail what happened to our patients over a five-year period? And how many of them suffered what's called sudden death? All of a sudden, they die for no apparent cause. The usual cause is a arrhythmia, an arrhythmia, a fatal arrhythmia, ventricular fibrillation, or the heart stops. So we decided to take a look to see whether handedness had anything to do with it. And some good news for left-handers and ambidextrous people. Right-handers were four times as likely to die from sudden death than left-handers or ambidextrous people. And our explanation is that we showed experimentally and also clinically that the right insulin of the brain is dominant for sympathetic activity, in other words, the fight or flight, and the left insulin is dominant for parasympathetic activity, in other words, rest and digest. And so if you knock out 
the right insula, it doubles your chances of dying, actually. And we think what happens is that because you create such, such an imbalance, such a dysrhythmia, that, you, that the heart ends up having these abnormal rhythms, some of them fatal. And this is one of the open questions that we have reported this some time ago, but no one has pursued the question, to what extent is handedness protective against sudden death? Now, let me pose a number of questions that may or may not have an answer already, but probably they're worth thinking about. It turns out that 26 uh, week uh, fetuses only have REM sleep. And uh, as they mature and as people grow, the, the proportion of REM sleep is less and less and less. So the question is, does uh, REM sleep relate to learning? Because we know about the consolidation that happens during REM sleep. I showed you uh, an article. And the question is, is learning really brain synchronization? Is there a relationship between REM sleep proportion and IQ? Does learning increase the proportion of REM sleep? Or having a higher proportion of REM sleep makes you a better student? I think this is very practical. I hope that one of you becomes interested in this. I'll be happy to be part of the project. I'd like to know. We also know that in Alzheimer's disease, the proportion of REM sleep is less than in age match controls. So this is an important question. And also, the really interesting thing is that we can prolong REM sleep with physiological means. Exercise is one way, and melatonin is another. So one other project that would be relatively easy to do with lots of student volunteers is, you know, have a group. You leave, yeah, I see Marie-José smiling. I don't see Julie. Oh, Julie is smiling. Hey, we have a project here. Okay? All right. So, I mean, that's, that's worth doing. Uh, oh, there's a volunteer. Andrea is a volunteer. Uh, another question, uh, which I already discussed, how long will keep that window open for learning languages and learning music? And then, oh, the other thing is, should we teach, you know, most of the time we don't care about rhythm. And most of the accents of, for, of people who don't speak English as native tongue has to do with the rhythm. You know, um, I, had, I had neighbor, Russian, in Canada, 13 years, he spoke like this, a Russian rhythm. Right. What if we sort of gave him to learn the, you know, the sort of English rhythm and then insert the words? I don't know. Has that been done? If it hasn't, let's do it. I'm willing to learn another language, French included. I'm so regretful I do not speak it, but I love to learn it. And if you find an easy way for me, like learn the rhythm and then put in the words, I'll be happy to. So I, I'm a volunteer too. And then, of course, the question, again, about the sudden death. Can you restore the imbalance? Can you create harmony? Can you create synchrony? And then uh, there's a whole effort out there to stimulate the brain, to inhibit it or to stimulate it, to modify the rhythmicity. It's used for depression. I think it's well established that that's helpful. They're doing it even for treatment of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease. There's a Dr. Lozano in Toronto who's doing, stimulating specific parts of the brain to see where that helps. It's used to, to treat epilepsy. <clears throat> and, and there's a whole industry looking at stimulating the brain or inhibiting the brain, which is really a restoration of rhythm. That's what it's about. <clears throat> now, to the conclusion, rhythm and synchrony and, and the related aspect of harmony are fundamental aspects of brain function. Secondly, the brain shapes language and, and music and culture shapes the brain. And finally, synchrony is a key concept in understanding brain and behavior, not only of human beings, but uh, I was in, just watch this. Uh, this is the Galapagos, two blue-footed babies courting. Synchronized the gate. 
The lesson here is if you entice, synchronize. Thank you. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you for this wonderful and inspiring um, presentation. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by saying that this um, idea of, of synchronization, and I think one of the points uh, that comes through in your talk, that there is several levels at which we can observe synchronization and rhythms. Um, this is even at the individual level, so we're going to look at brain activity, but it's also synchronization in terms of kinematics, movements. And then there's also interactions between individuals. And this is where I would like to go with my, with my question. Um, can synchrony and coupling of rhythms between individuals um, be a way to look into social interaction and social neuroscience? Some, some people, including researchers here in Montreal, including uh, Simone, uh, Caroline Palmer, uh, Isabel, uh, there's a strong interest in looking at oscillations in different individuals and how they synchronize, be it body movements, or be it actual directly brain activity between individuals. Um, what is your take on that? And do you think, what can we learn from exploring these uh, methods, like, for example, hyperscanning and things like this? Uh, definitely. I think that's a, that's a fertile field. And there are already examples. Uh, for example, uh, people who are courting, they tend to imitate each other's behavior, for one thing. That's synchronization, just like the, like the boobies. Uh, the other one is that storytellers, if somebody telling a story, then with a few milliseconds delay, they, they activate the same parts of the brain. And there is even a study looking at monkeys playing with a ball, where they synchronize, they anticipate what's being done, and they synchronize the movement. So absolutely, this is one in which, well again, synchrony seems to be a key to understanding. Now, the question I want to ask Isabel, or someone uh, who, who knows is, we know that, that we have, we cetaceans and certain birds have what's called mirror neurons, but I don't think boobies do. So what accounts for the, you know, for the synchronization of the lower species? <laughs> Dr. Parrott? First of all, I'd like to thank you for entering into our comfort zone. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> of course, I will not ask you questions in our field. That would be unfair, but I really wa want to thank you. And I wish I had a, a piece played by the uh, orchestra in Vienna, but we haven't made that. It's not too late. <laughs> That's a good, that, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment, because yesterday we, we had that conversation again, you know, uh, interesting, improbable uh, conversations, and you were mentioning the Amazon, you know, the study of this isolated tribe in the Amazon, and you mentioned the fact that they were not, uh, oh, you, okay, you, can you hear me? Okay, um, and that uh, they were not sensitive to dissonance, and we, di we, we, we just discussed the nature, nurture, importance of exposure. But what I forgot to mention is a very important effect in psychological science is not only music in the fact but we are extremely sensitive to that is that the more you listen to a piece or to a sort of music the more you like it and you are not conscious so that's what we call the mere exposure effect and it affects all the fields including yours i mean whatever yours is uh, uh, in medicine as well I mean, you have this kind of bias. It's a bias. It is studied. It's well known. The other thing that I wanted to mention, and I'm sorry, it's, uh, you know, there are many, many studies using EEG for certification, and you said it was an inspiration for you, and uh, it was not certification of EEG. I mean, I can appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and that you use repetition. But I'd like to mention something that is really special to music. We do use repetition a lot. And one idea that it makes us more engaged, like synchronization, like singing together, is not only rhythm. Um, while in language, we try to avoid repetition. So just food for thoughts. Well, well, thank you for complimenting what I said. I mean, this is additional knowledge, you know. You're giving us insights, and thank you. 
Um, so we, well, if you, yeah, let's let's proceed this way. I think we'll, we'll keep it informal. So if you have questions, jump in, and I'll we'll continue the discussion in parallel. We we'll do, we'll do this together. So go ahead. Yeah. Well, so first of all, uh, thank you so much to basically raise all these important points, uh, which you know some of us here at Brahms uh, are very much interested in about synchronization, how you know uh, brain activity and 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 movement and general general behavior is synchronized by very predictable stimuli like like music in the specific case. Just to answer your question, I mean, synchronization is not uh, something which is unknown in, in the, in the generally in nature. So we have this phenomenon of swarm behavior where you know, birds just synchronize their activities just towards a, a goal. However, what is special in humans is that we are very flexible in doing that. And, and uh, we uh, have entrainment mechanisms which makes that, uh, in a way, we, uh, uh, we predict what's coming later because of our brain activity and behavior getting in, in sync uh, in, in using these predictive mechanisms. And these predictive mechanisms may, can be uh, governed by different, more, more oscillatory dynamics, but also more Bayesian kind of uh, predictive coding uh, uh, processes. So there is a debate now which kind of mechanisms really driving this, this kind of synchronization. But I think we'll, there's, there are data showing basically that, yes, animals can synchronize, so the case of paras, the case of uh, sea lions, on the, which, are, which have been published recently. Um, but again, humans are very uh, sp special in that regard. We are very flexible, especially in, in group synchronization. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, maybe you could comment on that. We, we, are, we are used to think that synchronization is a beneficial phenomenon, and we basically are, so we, this is what we've shown in the lab, that if people synchronize, they can benefit because they get more um, socially attuned towards another individual. They can, patients can benefit from this synchronization. But are there any negative effects of synchronization? So what was the other side, you know, of the... Sure, of the sure. Okay. You're absolutely right. I mean, the worst and best known is epilepsy. You synchronize, and depending what part of the brain is involved, you convulse, etc. Uh, and also, I mentioned ripples, ripples and consolidation. But, but ripples can also be a prelude to epilepsy. And yes, synchronization can also be a bad thing, depending where it's originating and what it's causing. Yep. Um, in some ways, my question is slightly linked to what you just asked, um, linked to some of the earlier discussions too. Uh, you were talking about arrhythmia and um, that it, I can't quite recall, um, that it leads to disorganization when brain is disordered. And, and I guess what I'm thinking about is that it seems to me that there are all these different rhythms that exist in the world. And in many ways, the ones that we can see are pretty easy to recognize, but what's interesting are the ones we can't necessarily see and we don't see. And um, I ask this, uh, you know, I look at people who have, and I've had this on my, in my own experience, my brain was not functioning normally. I can see things other people can't see. So there are rhythms that exist, but because my brain is kind of disordered, at the point when I had the, I got hit, I am aware of rhythms most people can't see. So I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is how, how can disorganization lead to awareness of other organizations? Uh, I, I cannot comment with any personal knowledge, but I'm sure that there is a literature that relates to concussion that probably will answer your question or at least have addressed it. Now, I can share something with about concussion, which is practical. Uh, I have known since medical school that there's a thing called dementia pugilistica, meaning that, that if, you, uh, if you are a boxer and you lose too many bouts, you're more likely to develop dementia. What is new is that there was a study involving almost 200,000 American veterans uh, who suffered a concussion in Iraq or Afghanistan without loss of consciousness. And that exposure doubled their chances of developing dementia. Now, I raise the point because I worry about our children or young people playing hockey. I worry about American football. And I worry about the world 
that pl plays uh, soccer and use it butts their heads. So uh, going back to the question you asked, uh, there probably is someone who is studying trauma, and I think your question is a very interesting one. And if it hasn't been answered, it's worth pursuing. Okay, we take another question, yep. Thank you, Dr. Hashinsky, oh, very yes. interesting. How are you doing, Vladimir? So, um, I was thinking about the, the issue of synchronicity and language and communication and repetition and... Is that me? Okay, so um, I think that uh, language requires repetition. That is how we learn language. It's very important to repeat, and repetition is important to acquire syntax and even to learn discourse structures. Uh, but uh, synchronicity, which is also a part of repetition, because if we are not synchronized, we cannot repeat, becomes something essential to communication because we can have language, but to communicate, we have to be absolutely synchronized. And this synchronicity, going back to the previous question and what could be in there underneath synchronicity that is guiding music, language, uh, it could be something that has to do with emotions and affect that is there and that is put into play, whether it is musical, verbal, nonverbal, uh, cinema, and so forth. And maybe this is a kind of rhythm also <laughs> that could be explored, particularly we are exploring it with uh, persons with dementia, showing that if you can get in communication by reference to the emotional aspects, you can get into a synchronicity that in the end favors verbal communication. So uh, to say the, 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 uh, it's really nice to hear about this concept of synchronicity from the cell to very complex levels of human functioning. And I think that the questions you raised there are all very interesting projects that we should care about. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think there's little doubt that information is only a small part of language. And uh, I'm happy to report that my wife and I have never had a major disagreement on major issues. The few disagreements we have had had to do with tone. Of course you're right, dear. I didn't like your tone, right? So clearly there are ways in which you can express things that are not there. And, and also body language. Absolutely. You know, the way how you convey it. So it's a whole repertoire. And even in lectures that has been studied, and I've forgotten the precise percentage, but apparently uh, the rating of a, a lecture, only 15% is on the quality of the information. The rest is, God only knows, projection, non emotion, inspiration. Yeah. Non so you have a very good point. So I just want to go back to the synchronization aspect of the, the brain rhythms in response to simulation, including language learning. Um, it actually seems that synchronization is important, but desynchronization is as important, in fact. And the, the intellectual disability, uh, children or adults will show too much synchronization um, in response to a repeated uh, stimulus, which will show that they're not learning, in fact. So I just wanted to point out that um, it seems that the desynchronization following the synchronization is as important for, for learning. And also, um, I want to point out that we think that this lack of um, having access to the desynchronization mechanism may be linked to uh, the general structure of the brain, as well as the molecular aspects um, of the, the micro-signaling in, in the brain. And I was wondering, in your experience, if there's other models, uh, like the heart, for example, that where the, the structure of the heart, for example, would be extremely important for uh, the, the rhythmic organization. Well, your point about uh, 
arrhythmia or, or lack of, it's also important. The brain, not everything. There's also a, a, an amount of randomness in the brain. And I gather from those who know complex system that that makes it more efficient, has to do with communication. Going back to the heart, even though the heart seems to be very boring, boom, 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 it's really very complex. And there are periods in which it, it is irregular. So I concede the point that it, it isn't all about rhythms. And as we heard before, some of the rhythms can be bad. So it, it, it is both. But I think that if you're looking for something that will explain a larger amount uh, in the physical world, in the brain, and, uh, and in social relationship, I think rhythm is a good start. But we have to acknowledge that there are exceptions there. The world is more complex than we perceive it at this point. It's just really going to be a comment to your, uh, to your statement that, uh, you know, some people might be able to per perceive certain rhythms that would be impossible for others. And it reminds me of the example that usually in science we like to have a big signal and very small noise, but there is certain senses in our system, for example, uh, a tactile perception that has been shown to be in certain situations much, much more sensitive when you introduce noise, so if you have a certain amount of noise, you're much better to distinguish certain rhythms and certain actions than you otherwise would. So sometimes, uh, in, in certain systems I know, introducing noise and not good things, so to speak, randomness, actually enhances the perceptibility. Well, actually, there's a very specific example. They thought that doing CDs with the purest sounds would be more appreciated. Now we are going back to vinyl which has precisely the characteristic that you say, has a little bit of noise and apparently better quality. Okay, I think this uh, brings us very much close to the, to the end of this. As I, as, I, as I said, this was going to be frustrating because I know we have a lot of questions and I'd like to thank all the people who ask these uh, uh, very nice questions. I, I'm going to finish off with one last question as a, as a discussant for this session. Um, and uh, uh, the aim of this question is because we talked a lot about being outside of the comfort zone. And so now my question is going to try to put everybody outside of the comfort zone. Um, and I'm going to go with a, with, with a question related to uh, the importance of rhythms, biological rhythms, for biological intelligence. This is something that has been shown. And so in the move today towards doing biologically inspired artificial intelligence, what is your take on how, what are the properties about rhythms that we might need to incorporate into artificial intelligence if our aim is to have uh, human-level intelligence in machines? Yeah, my understanding is that the field that was now called uh, artificial intelligence was started years ago, and it came to sort of a dead end. And then a fellow called Hinton, who is now in Toronto, said, look, why don't we use the brain as a model? And that has really opened up the field. So I think that to answer your question, I think the brain is a very good model for artificial intelligence. So what you're saying is that our machines, we should teach our machines to sleep because they have this bio and they will learn better by sleeping? Yeah, I think so. Okay, I think that we should all agree on this. All machines and human beings should sleep a little bit more. I'm sure Julie oh, no, would agree uh, with this. Uh, just a minute, before we get carried away to artificial intelligence, last year, as part of the Killam Award, I got, I, I, got, um, I, I got interviewed. And I was asked the question, you think artificial intelligence is going to replace doctors? And I said, just the poor ones. Because I said that medicine is an art and a science, and the art begins where the science ends. So it, 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 that means to me that information can, and, and artificial intelligence can take us just so far. But that human element is hard to pin, uh, pin down, and it probably is much more complex and much more desirable. So we'll always, so I don't feel threatened by artificial intelligence because I think we humans are by far a better product of the universe. On that, thank you very much again, Vladimir Hachinsky, for this wonderful talk. Merci.